I'm really pleased today to welcome Dr. Andrew Kolodny, a leading expert on the opioid crisis. I've asked Emily Campbell, who is a visiting instructor in sociology, who's teaching a course titled Drugs in the Americas here at the college, and was one of the advocates for inviting Dr. Kolodny to introduce him to us today. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Kolodny to Holy Cross for his timely and important talk. Uh, Dr. Kolodny is a national expert on the prescription opioid and heroin crisis. He currently serves as the medical director of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Previously, he served as both the chief medical officer for Phoenix House, a national nonprofit addiction treatment agency, as well as chair of psychiatry at Mayamadi's Medical Center in New York City. He began his career at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And in New York, he helped to develop citywide buprenorphine programs, Naxalon overdose prevention programs, and treatment interventions. Additionally, as a national voice in the medical community, he co-founded and serves as executive director to phys physicians for opioid, responsible opioid prescribing that works through prescriber education, consumer education, and advocacy. In my own research on grieving families, I've seen firsthand the long shadow overdose death casts in American life. Since 2000, 400,000 people have died, constituting the worst public health crisis in American history. Here in Massachusetts, a survey of residents last year found that one in four knew someone who had fatally overdosed, and half of Massachusetts residents knew somebody currently struggling with addiction. As such, we are particularly grateful to have Dr. Kalandi here to share his insights and expertise with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with all of you about the opioid crisis. I've been speaking about this problem for, for many years now, uh, more than a decade. And um, when I first started speaking about the opioid crisis, uh, generally I would try and convince an audience that we have a serious problem with opioids in the United States. Um, unfortunately, I don't have to do that anymore. I think everybody's aware that we've got a, a pretty serious problem. And, and for folks who are trying to raise awareness, uh, you know, I don't think we can pat ourselves on the back. I don't think that we're the reason that everybody woke up to this problem. What I, I think happened is that the problem continued to become so severe and uh, continued to affect so many individuals and families that it became impossible uh, to continue to, to ignore. Let me just ask, um, I just want to do a quick survey. Uh, with a show of hands, how many people here have a friend or family member or themselves have been affected in some way by the opioid crisis. Yeah. So it's most of the hands, I think. So uh, I'm not obviously going to tell you we have an opioid crisis. What I am going to try and do over the next hour is help you better understand it, help you make sense of it, um, and you know, and I, I think um, uh, when the talk is done, you'll feel much uh, a much better understanding of the problem, and, and you'll feel like experts about about it, which I, I think will be helpful to you and, and potentially helpful if you go into careers where you may uh, be involved in responding to the problem. Let me start by saying something that uh, unfortunately is not obvious. It's not even obvious to doctors who prescribe opioids. When we talk about drugs like hydrocodone, which is in Vicodin, Lortab, Norco, or oxycodone, which is in Percocet and Oxycontin, when we talk about some of these very commonly prescribed opioids, we're talking about drugs that are literally made from opium. You need opium to make Percocet and Oxycontin and Vicodin. Uh, inside opium, occurring naturally, are the opiate molecules. Opiate refers to the naturally occurring molecules, codeine, morphine, and thebane. They're, they exist naturally inside the sap from the poppy plant, which is opium. Now, you can take those molecules that exist naturally inside opium and make them semi-synthetic. You can tweak the molecules. 
And that's what you're doing when you make some of these other opioids. Heroin is made from morphine and oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxymorphone. These are all semi-synthetic opioids made from the naturally occurring opioids. Now, why would anybody bother to turn an opiate into a semi-synthetic opioid? Why, why do drug cartels go to the, uh, why do they put in the effort to turn opium sap into heroin? Because there is effort involved. Well, when you create a semi-synthetic opioid, what you're doing is you're creating a molecule that can get into the brain faster. The, the uh, pharmacologic term that we would use would be lipophilic, fat loving. When you, what you're doing is you're making the molecule more dissolvable in fat so that it can cross something called the blood-brain barrier more quickly. In other words, when you make heroin, you're creating a molecule that has a more rewarding effect, gets into the brain faster, and it's also stronger. That's really the same idea behind making oxycodone, hydrocodone, and these other semi-synthetic opioids. So what, what you're doing is you're making drugs that have a more rewarding effect or have a, a faster analgesic onset. And so what's the point that I'm making? The point is that when we talk about some of these commonly prescribed opioids, we're, we're talking about molecules that are almost identical to heroin. There was a study done at Columbia University where they gave experienced heroin users an opportunity to self-administer different opioids, and they didn't tell them which was which. It was kind of like a blind taste test. And in that study, the heroin users actually preferred oxycodone over the heroin. It wasn't statistically significant, because it was almost the same, but if anything, it was the oxycodone that beat heroin in, in this blind taste test. So the point is when we talk about opioid pain medicines, we're essentially talking about heroin pills. Now to make such a strong statement doesn't mean that doctors should never prescribe opioids. These are important medicines for, for treating pain at the end of life. They also play an important role if someone's just had major surgery or a serious accident, if they're going to be used for a couple of days. But unfortunately, the bulk of the consumption, the bulk of the prescribing in the United States is not for end of life care or a couple of days after surgery. The bulk of the prescribing and the consumption is for conditions where opioids may be more likely to harm the patient than help the patient. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is an old slide. The CDC came out with this slide in 2010. And there was a three-year lag in the data, which is why you see the, this last bar here. That's 2007. This is the rate of drug overdose deaths. And when the CDC came out with this slide in 2010, they had just started referring to the opioid crisis using the term epidemic. And when the CDC began referring to this rise in deaths involving prescription opioids as an epidemic, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, started to get criticized. The criticism was coming from organizations taking money from drug companies, pain organizations, that said to the CDC, stop calling this an epidemic. You're exaggerating. It's not an epidemic. And by calling it an epidemic, you're going to scare doctors from prescribing these medicines. And the problem of untreated pain in America will get worse. And so knock it off. The CDC responded to its critics by saying, we're the CDC. We don't use the term epidemic lightly. This is an epidemic. And then they went even further. They said, not only is this an epidemic, this is the worst drug addiction epidemic in United States history. And that's the point they're making with this graph. The box to the left that says heroin, that's the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. And the box to the right that says cocaine, that's the crack cocaine epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s. 
And the point that they were making with this graph is that overdose deaths by uh, 2007 were much higher than they had ever been before and higher than those two previous epidemics combined. Now, I, I mentioned this as an old slide, so I want you to understand what's happened since 2007. In 2008, it went up. In 2009, overdose deaths, the rate of overdose deaths went up again. In 2010, it went up. 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We peaked in, the, in 2017 with 72,000 Americans dying from a drug overdose. Now, we just recently received the 2018 data, so the, you'll see the lag is getting a, a little shorter. The CDC is getting this data out a little quicker. In 2018, it came down a tiny bit. Um, and that drop that we saw in 2018, which hopefully is not a fluke, hopefully it's the beginning of a new trend, um, but that's the first time in 25 years that we actually saw deaths come down instead of breaking a new record. Now, this graph is just showing you all drug overdose deaths. It's not telling us what specific drugs are involved in the deaths. So you'll see that on this graph. And this is what the picture looked like up till 2010. And I'll show you what it looks like since 2010 in a minute. Um, you could see that what really caused that enormous increase in deaths that we were just looking at up till 2010 it was almost entirely due to the red line. And the red line, you'll see, is prescription opioid overdoses. You could see heroin down here in green was risen. It increased just a little bit. Here's benzodiazepines. That's drugs like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium. The, the trend is somewhat concerning. Um, and this is cocaine, cocaine deaths that actually started to come down. What was really driving the increase was prescription opioids. Now after 2010, the picture changed. And you could see the green here is total opioid deaths. It's really adding up these lines below. Here's purple is prescription opioids. Orange is heroin. And this black line is synthetic opioids. And a, a synthetic opioid, unlike a natural opioid, morphine, codeine, or a semi-synthetic opioid, oxycodone, hydrocodone, a synthetic opioid, you actually don't need opium to make it. You can make it completely out of, out of chemicals. And fentanyl is really uh, illegal fentanyl is what really accounts for a very sharp increase in these deaths here. Now, something if you're interested in, in the opioid crisis, if, if it's something you've been studying, uh, and, or if you're just closely observing the media's reporting on all of this, you may have come across a popular explanation for this graph an explanation for the trends that you're looking at. It's an explanation that's not accurate, and, and I'll explain why. The common explanation for what you're looking at, for the fact that the prescription opioid deaths stopped going up at a time when deaths involving heroin and then illegal fentanyl started to go up rapidly, the explanation you're hearing is that there was a crackdown on the pills so drug users all switched from using pills to using heroin. That's why the heroin goes up as you see the pills flatten. And then the drug users switched from heroin to fentanyl. And, you know, and in other words, they're, they're switching from, from to more dangerous opioids. And that's why the, the deaths have been going up. That's the popular explanation. And it's partly correct. And it's partly wrong. The switching part is correct in that the vast majority of people who started to use heroin after 1995 were first addicted to prescription opioids and switched to heroin. That part is true. But the switching doesn't really happen here. And there really hasn't been a crackdown on the painkillers. We are still massively overprescribing. We don't have 
this homogenous group of drug users who are all switching from one drug to another. It's much more complicated than that. The opioid crisis looks different in different parts of the country, and it's affecting different age groups and racial groups differently, and I'll show you that. So for one thing, this fentanyl, this synthetic opioid that's extremely potent, uh, uh, it's, it's many times more potent than heroin, so even a small amount mixed into heroin can easily kill, kill someone. This fentanyl problem that we're having that accounts for a very sharp increase in deaths that we've seen over the past few years is really affecting the eastern half of the United States. The western half of the United States hasn't really been hit very hard with fentanyl. That's one thing you'll miss in a lot of the reporting on the problem. And something else many people don't recognize is the geographic area that's been hit the hardest with fentanyl in the United States is actually inner city Washington, D.C., where you have this aging group of survivors of the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. The heroin, ep how many people saw the film American Gangster? with Denzel Washington. It's, it's a pretty good film, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend it. It's set in the 1970s in Harlem during the, the heroin epidemic. The heroin epidemic of the 1970s hit poor, non-white, inner city communities like Washington, D.C. very hard. And survivors from that epidemic who were in their 50s and 60s and 70s, because there is fentanyl in the heroin supply, they're dying at a very high rate right now. So just another example of what I'm talking about, these are just two different states where you can see that the opioids involved in the deaths are very different. For example, in the state of Oklahoma, the opioid still most likely to kill people is a prescription opioid, whereas in the state of West Virginia, you'd see fentanyl as the number one killer. Anybody know in the state of Massachusetts which opioid is killing the most people in this state? Anybody want to guess? You can guess. Fentanyl. And so Massachusetts is a state that's been hit very hard with fentanyl. So that, that narrative that I mentioned that's incorrect about the drug users suddenly switching in the context of a crackdown, the switching didn't happen just a couple of years ago. Switching from prescription opioids to heroin happened a while ago. Now, the graph on the right is blacks. The graph on the left is whites. And I want you to look at the age group uh, 20 to 34 years old. That's the red line. Now, if you look at blacks 20 to 34 years old, you'll, if you look closely, you see there's actually decreasing heroin use among young blacks. And there's, that's a trend that's been in place for more than 30 years. Crack cocaine as well, which hit inner city communities very hard. For the past 20, 30 years, young people in those communities have really been staying away from crack cocaine and heroin. If you go into communities that were hit hard with crack and heroin, you'll still find crack cocaine users and heroin users, but like I said, they're this aging, shrinking cohort that survived those previous epidemics. The young people in those communities learn to stay away from these drugs. Anybody ever hear the, the slogan, crack is whack? Does that sound familiar? That wasn't a slogan that a health department came up with. That was kids in communities that were hit hard with crack cocaine who said, crack is whack, and they, and they really did start to stay away from it. So what about whites? Whites ages 20 to 34. Look at what's going on. You see rising use of heroin there. And that's not heroin use that started rising in the context of some so-called crackdown on the painkillers. Young whites in the United States started switching to heroin really at the very beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. This graph begins in 2003, but that red line started to go up in the, the late 90s. These are young white people who became opioid addicted in one of three different ways. They got addicted to opioids because they were taking the pills because they liked the effect, and they did that a little bit too much and wound up getting hooked. Or 
They got addicted to opioids that were, because a doctor prescribed opioids very aggressively to them. Maybe a young person with a chronic medical problem or they had had a serious accident. They were put on a couple of months worth of opioids and then couldn't come off. And then the third way that young people have become opioid addicted, which might actually be the most common way, is almost a combination of the first two. It's a brief medical exposure, wisdom teeth, sports injury. They don't get addicted from that very brief exposure, but they're basically getting their first taste of the drug from a doctor or a dentist. They may like the effect. They're not afraid of it because they took it and it didn't hurt them and it was prescribed to them by a medical professional. And at some point after that brief medical exposure, there's a period of non-medical use. And it could be immediately with the leftover pills, gee, those were good, I'll keep taking them. Or it could be two or three years later. They're hanging out with some friends and someone's got a, a pill bottle full and they say, oh yeah, I remember those, I'll have some of those, I like those. And there's a period of recreational use. And so that's how they're getting addicted. Now, when these young people become addicted, once they're addicted, they need to make, once anybody becomes opioid addicted, you need to maintain your supply or you're going to be feeling very sick. Once you become addicted, you're not doing this because it's fun at that point. Once you become addicted, you're doing it because without the drug, you feel awful. And when I say awful, I'm not just referring to the flu-like symptoms that people will experience that we call opioid withdrawal. Because you know, the, if you've ever wondered why people who are addicted to opioids do such desperate things to maintain their opioid supply, it's not that they're afraid to feel like they have the flu. It's actually not the physical symptoms that are the worst of it. When people are going into withdrawal, there's, it's been described as a sense of impending doom. There's a region of the brain that makes us anxious that, that if you take an opioid, it quiets the region of the brain. But when you take away the opioids and they're going into withdrawal, the region of the brain the, that controls our fight or flight response our adrenaline, our, our, uh, the hormones that you would want to surge if you were going to run for your life because there's a, a lion in the jungle ready to tear you to pieces, that region of the brain that's important for survival, that, that makes you panic when panic is helpful, when you're going into withdrawal, that region of the brain is firing and people feel like they're going to die, which is why good people will behave badly, like even rob pharmacies to, to forge prescriptions to, to get more opioids. So these young people need to maintain their opioid supply. Even if they became addicted from a doctor's prescription, when they go back to the doctor and they need that, that large supply of opioids every month, doctors don't like giving healthy looking 25 year olds a large quantity of pills every month for, for chronic pain. Unless the doctor is a drug dealer, and unfortunately some are, that would make the doctor uncomfortable. And so these young people who became opioid addicted and they need to maintain their opioid supply, they wind up on the black market, on the street, basically buying pills from, from drug dealers. The pills are very expensive on the black market. Does anybody happen to know how much an 80 milligram OxyContin sold for in 2003? Anybody know how much the 30 milligram immediate release oxycodones sell for on the street? They call them Perk 30s or Blues. Probably somebody knows but doesn't want to say, but that, that's okay. Um, the, it's a dollar a milligram. Um, and back in 2003, the 80 milligram oxycontins were selling for $80 a pill. The 30 milligram immediate release oxycodone, that's the most popular pill on the black market today, is $30 a pill. And so that's very expensive. And if that young person was in a region of the country where heroin was available, they'd switch because it produces the same effect and it's much cheaper. And what's happened steadily, not starting in 2013 when the deaths began to go up, but much earlier, steadily, we started to see heroin move into more regions of the country where it wasn't previously available to meet the demand for it. 
by this growing number of young people who had become addicted to pills. When, when I was a teenager uh, and in my 20s, um, if you wanted to buy heroin, you had to go into one of these, into a dangerous neighborhood that had been hit with heroin in the 1970s. You did not find heroin easily available in, sub in suburbs and rural areas. That, that totally changed. It began to move in to meet the demand for it. Now, what about the green line? What about white people 45 and up? You don't see rising use of heroin among middle-aged whites. Does that mean that the opioid crisis is sparing middle-aged white people in the United States? No rising use of heroin. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that. Middle-aged white people in the United States have been hit especially hard. So why no rising use of heroin among middle-aged white people? Well, these middle-aged folks, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, these are people who've become opioid addicted almost entirely through medical treatment. When they become addicted, they generally don't have too hard a time finding doctors who will write them a prescription on a monthly basis for lots of opioids, for, for chronic pain. And even when the patient's primary care doctor or their geriatrician gets nervous because the patient is coming in early asking for higher and higher doses, the doctor doesn't want to put a label like addiction on the patient. The patient will almost always say, well, I was taking extra pills because my pain got worse. And when these patients get referred anywhere because they're saying their pain got worse, they get referred to pain management doctors. And then it's hit or miss. The patient may be sent to a pain management doctor that's going to work very hard to try and get the patient off of the pain medicine and address their pain with other modalities. Or they could wind up with a pain management doctor that has no problem going even higher and higher on the dose. Something many people don't realize is that before the heroin supply became so dangerous because of fentanyl, when you looked at where most of the deaths were occurring, it was in this older group that gets pills more easily from doctors than it was in the younger group that's been switching to heroin. You can see that on this graph here. So the light blue are deaths involving opioid pain relievers. The dark blue are deaths involving heroin. And you can see the age group where you had most of the deaths was this middle age group. And you know, if you look just at heroin, dark blue, there were more heroin deaths in this younger group, but still significantly more deaths overall and from prescription opioids in the middle age group. With the emergence of fentanyl, we started to see this uh, younger group catch up. And, and you're kind of seeing that on this graph here. I'm going to summarize what I've said so far. We don't have this homogenous group of drug users, drug abusers who are all switching from one drug to another, as the popular narrative would suggest. We have, roughly speaking, three groups of opioid-addicted Americans. The first group is a group that's uh, disproportionately white. They're young. Their addiction began with pills, and they switched to heroin. And because the heroin supply in the eastern half of the United States is so dangerous because of fentanyl, they're dying at an extremely high rate right now. The second group middle-aged white folks and up. This is a group whose addiction began taking, with taking prescription opioids. It's a group that hasn't been switching to heroin and has been dying from the painkillers. And it's a group that's doing a little bit better right now because the prescribing has been getting a bit more cautious. And then you have a third group that became, that are really survivors of a much older epidemic, an epidemic where the opioid addiction began not with pills but with heroin use. And in this group, which I think probably gets the least amount of attention, the deaths have also been soaring in the eastern half of the United States because of what drug in the heroin supply? Fentanyl. Thank you. 
So these are headlines that uh, I pulled uh, off of the internet a couple of years ago. And these are headlines from news stories that are about the opioid crisis. But, but what is the opioid crisis? What's the right way to really frame what we're talking about when we say we have an opioid crisis? Or what's the wrong way to frame it? The wrong way to frame the opioid crisis, and un unfortunately the way it's often described, is as an epidemic of drug abuse. You'll sometimes hear this described as a, it's a crisis of prescription drug abuse or heroin abuse. You'll hear that abuse word, which is really the, the wrong term. It's the wrong way to really describe the problem. If you refer to our opioid crisis as a drug abuse problem, what I think you're really suggesting is that the crisis is about a lot of people behaving badly taking dangerous drugs because it feels good and they're accidentally killing themselves. And if that was really the issue, then the challenge is how do we stop people from behaving badly and, and, and change that behavior? Th that's not really what's going on. As we've, as we've talked about, you know, some people may get addicted because they were abusing opioids, taking them because they like the effect. Other people got addicted taking opioids as prescribed. Regardless of how you got addicted, once you're addicted, you're not doing this for fun anymore. You're doing it because you have to keep doing it to avoid feeling awful or to feel any degree of pleasure in your life. And so the correct way to describe our opioid crisis, the correct way to frame this problem is as an epidemic of opioid addiction. If you frame it as an epidemic of opioid addiction, what you're saying is that the reason the United States is experiencing record high levels of opioid overdose deaths, the reason we're seeing heroin and fentanyl flood into non-urban areas, the reason we've seen a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent, children winding up in the foster care system, outbreaks of injection-related infectious diseases, impact on the workforce. The driver behind all of these health and social problems that we call the opioid crisis it has been a sharp increase in the number of Americans, the prevalence, the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. From 1997 to 2011, a 900% increase in the number of Americans addicted to opioids. I'm going to show you the epidemic happening actually with the with the map with a series of maps. Now, the epidemic began in the year 1996. This is 3 years into the epidemic, 1999. And what you're looking at here are the, is the rate in different states of people showing up at drug treatment facilities saying that the primary drug that they're addicted to is a prescription opioid. State licensed facilities, people come in for treatment, they're asked what's the main drug that you're addicted to? This is the rate of people who said main drug I'm addicted to is a prescription opioid. And what you can see is that three years into the epidemic, there were a few states showing up as red or maroon, indicating that they had high rates of people addicted to prescription opioids. I want you to watch what happens to the color of the map as we go forward in time. So this is 1996, I'm sorry, this is 1999. We're gonna go up by two years. This is 2001. Two thousand three, two thousand five, two thousand seven, and two thousand nine. By two thousand nine, every state in the country had experienced a sharp increase in the prevalence, the number of people addicted to prescription opioids. And when you have a sharp increase in a disease, over a short period of time, that is the definition of an epidemic. 
So what's caused this epidemic? What's caused these maps to turn red? I think one of the best answers to that question came from a researcher at the CDC, uh, Dr. Lynn Palazzi. He, and uh, Dr. Palazzi was working in the CDC's Injury Prevention Center. He was the guy in the United States responsible for accidental deaths. And he had to monitor that. That was the issue that was on his plate, deaths from accidents. And in the early 2000s, Dr. Palazzi starts to recognize that poisoning deaths, that type of accidental death, are beginning to surpass the category of motor vehicle accident death. Now, up until the early 2000s, if you died from an accident in the United States, there was a pretty good chance it was a car crash. Something like 90% of accidental deaths were, were motor vehicle accidents, not poisonings. Poisonings were uncommon. He starts to see that the poisoning deaths are going up, and he says, if this trend continues, more Americans will die from poisoning than die from car crashes. And that, that trend actually did continue. More people in the United States today die from, from poisoning than die from a car crash. Now, Len Palazzi has to figure this out. Well, it took Len a few minutes to figure out that these poisoning deaths are not kids drinking some household chemical under the kitchen sink, that these poisoning deaths are prescription opioid deaths because the CDC has the death certificate data. So, so he figures out pretty quickly, okay, the, these are prescription opioid deaths. Now, now he's got to understand, well, why are deaths involving prescription opioids taking off? Why are more Americans beginning to die from, from pain medicine than from car crashes? What is going on? To answer the question, Len did something pretty interesting on this graph. What he did was he charted out in orange, deaths involving prescription opioids over time. And you see that orange line going up over time. And then, on the same graph, he charted out sales for prescription opioids. And what does that really mean? That means prescriptions. You know, people don't walk into a pharmacy and say, I'll, I'll have 200 tablets of Percocet, please. They, they walk in with a prescription. What Len argued in his paper is that the soaring increase in deaths has been caused by the medical community over-prescribing, that as we started to become more aggressive in our prescribing of opioids, the deaths went up right along with the increase in, in the prescribing. He really argued in his paper that there was a change in the culture of opioid prescribing, and that's what's causing this, this problem. This is an old graph. This is a little bit more current. For several years, this was a chief speaking point for the CDC. On this graph, the green line represents consumption of opioids in the United States. The red line represents deaths involving prescription opioids, and the blue line represents addiction to prescription opioids. And the point here that the CDC is making is that as that green line has gone up, the red line and the blue line went up along with it. The CDC's message to the medical community has been very clear. What, they're really, what they've been saying is you all need to prescribe much more cautiously. That green line has to come down if we want to bring this crisis under control. Now, I can tell you that pharmaceutical companies that manufacture opioids don't agree with the CDC. And initially, they were denying that these three lines were going up together. In fact, scientists getting paid money from pharmaceutical companies were publishing papers in medical journals arguing or, sh or claiming that the prescribing of opioids is increasing in the United States, but there's no evidence of any adverse public health problem associated with the rise in the prescribing. In other words, we can have our cake and eat it too. What they didn't put in their paper was clear evidence that there were problems associated with the rise in, in the prescribing. 
by around 2008, 2009, some of the pharmaceutical comp companies stopped denying that these three lines were going up together. In fact, they began to acknowledge that yes, as the prescribing has gone up, there have been some public health problems associated with it. But what they said was that the green line doesn't have to come down. The CDC is wrong. All we need to do is make the pills hard to crush for snorting or injecting so-called abuse deterrent formulations. And, and if we teach doctors to prescribe the harder to crush pills, that we're patenting and charging even more money for, then, um, then we can have our cake and eat it too. The green line doesn't have to come down. Pharmaceutical companies haven't just been saying these things, they've been putting their money where their mouth is. This is data that came from an investigation by the Associated Press and the Center for Public Integrity, where they looked at spending by what they termed the opioid lobby the manufacturers and distributors of opioids and the groups that get money from them. And what they found was that over a 10 year period that the opioid lobby had spent $880 million blocking any kind of federal or state policy or law or regulation that would have resulted in less prescribing, that they spent $880 million to preserve the status quo, to keep the, the green line where it is. And what they found was that, they, that the opioid lobby spent eight times more than the gun lobby. Groups like the NRA was spending trying to block gun control. Fortunately, opioid prescribing in the United States has started to come down. Uh, we peaked in around 2011, 2012, right about here. This blue line is showing you oxycodone consumption in the United States. See this red line down here? That's oxycodone consumption in Europe. We're looking at per capita consumption. So even though the prescribing of oxycodone and of opioids in the United States has started to come down a bit, there is still no other country on earth that comes close to prescribing as much opioids as we do. That's, this is one of the reasons why I say, what crackdown are they talking about when they say you know, that, that pills dried up and so drug users switched? So here, uh, this is a little more current. This is showing you a, just another way of looking at opioid consumption in the United States. And again, you see that we peak around the 2011, 2012 year. And then the prescribing starts to trend finally in a more cautious direction. But you know, even with a more ambitious target, by 2023, we'll still be more than double where we were in opioid consumption before we had a crisis. So what caused the prescribing to go up? You know, I've, I've explained that the opioid crisis is an epidemic of opioid addiction. And I've explained that the reason that we have an epidemic of opioid addiction was we've really overexposed the US population to this highly addictive class of drug. It was the change in the culture of opioid prescribing in the United States. Now, you know, I, I want to ask, or try and answer what changed the culture of prescribing in the United States. Why did doctors start to prescribe opioids so much more aggressively? Well, there's a pretty good clue on this graph because you can actually see the exact year that oxycodone takes off. It's 1996. Now, this is New York State data, but I can tell you that every state in the country, really, it's the same graph. So you could see that 1996 was the year that the oxycodone takes off in the United States. Now, if you've been uh, studying this problem, you might know that 1996 was the first year that OxyContin hit the market. And OxyContin being extended release oxycodone, the, the drug introduced by Purdue Pharma and by the Sacker family, so you might look at this and you, knowing that this is the year that OxyContin was released, you could explain this graph by saying, well, up until, up until 1996, what you're looking at is Percocet and Percodan, pills that were on the market earlier that had a little bit of oxycodone mixed with Tylenol. 
And after 1996, you're looking at the introduction of this, these extended release oxycodone pills. They pack a whopping dose. The company is aggressively marketing the product and the prescribing is taking off. And so you could explain this whole trend by saying this was the, the, you know, the marketing of oxycontin. But take a look at hydrocodone. You kind of see the same picture here. Yeah, there was a little bit of an increase before 1996, but 1996 is also the year Vicodin takes off. 1996 was also the year morphine prescribing goes up, and Dilaudid with hydromorphone goes up, the fentanyl patch goes up. Every opioid that was on the market before 1996, 1996 is the year that the prescribing of it takes off. Begs the question, what happened in 1996 that changed the way doctors were prescribing opioids? I think one of the best answers to that question can be found in a government report by an agency called the GAO. And what they looked at in this report were the activities that Purdue Pharma engaged in in 1996 when it introduced OxyContin. And what you're looking at here is a graph from the report that shows you spending, promotional spending. And they're showing you that Purdue Pharma by year five was spending 30 million a year, oops, spending 30 million a year promoting OxyContin. Now, you could look at this graph and you could ask me a good question. You could say, well, Dr. Claudney, if the GAO is correct, if this was all about Purdue Pharma and their spending on promoting OxyContin, why did morphine go up and Vicodin go up and why did all the opioids go up? If it was all about Purdue Pharma's promotion of OxyContin, why wasn't the increase limited to oxycodone if they're promoting an oxycodone containing product? They answer the question in the report. What they point out is that the bulk of what Purdue Pharma was really doing, and yeah, I'm talking a lot about Purdue Pharma, but other drug companies very quickly got involved in this. The bulk of what they were doing was focused on opioids as a class of drug. It was non-branded. What were they interested in when they introduced OxyContin? What did they want? I guess they wanted the same thing any company wants with a product, financial success. They were introducing OxyContin, they wanted a blockbuster drug. Blockbuster drug is the term for a drug that brings in more than a billion in sales a year. They wanted a blockbuster. And so they're introducing OxyContin, extended release oxycodone, they want a blockbuster, but they had a problem. And they knew it because they did some focus group testing before they introduced OxyContin. The problem that Purdue figured out they had was that you know, OxyContin, if that's only prescribed to people at the end of life with cancer, which is a good reason to give someone an extended release opioid, well, we're not going to have a blockbuster drug. End of life cancer pain is not very common and the patients won't be on your product for very long if they're near the end of life. The way we, you can have a blockbuster drug is if you can get doctors to prescribe opioids for common chronic conditions. But what they learned from their focus group, when the focus groups, when they brought doctors around a table and said to, a, to the doctors, doctors, uh, would you prescribe an opioid for your patient's low back pain? Or, or doctor, would you prescribe opioids for your patient's chronic headache? or their fibromyalgia. When they went around and asked the doctors these questions in the early 90s, doctors answered these questions by saying no. And if the doctor was asked, well, why wouldn't you give your back pain patients lots of opioids? The doctors would say, well, I'd be concerned that if I gave lots of my patients a highly addictive drug and prescribed it long term, I'd be worried that lots of my patients would get addicted. I would be worried about the tolerance to the pain relieving effect. 
so that if the patients w wanted to continue to get pain relief, they would need higher and higher and higher doses. And as the doses got higher and higher, it would get more dangerous. I would be worried about the physiological dependence that sets in on the drug that would make it very hard for them to come off without feeling really sick and anxious, even if they didn't clearly get addicted to it. So no, I wouldn't use opioids for these common chronic conditions. What Purdue Pharma and other drug companies did was to reframe good reasons for being cautious with opioids as barriers to compassionate pain care. And in 20,000 educational programs for doctors that were sponsored by Purdue Pharma in the first six years of the release of OxyContin, these were the messages. Doctors start hearing that patients are suffering needlessly because we've been too stingy with these drugs. That we're suffering from the, the term that they used and sometimes still use today, opiophobia. Anybody know when you put phobia at the end of a word what that means? It means irrational fear. That, so that the medical community has an irrational fear of getting patients addicted, that real addiction is extremely rare. Don't worry about the dependence on the drug. Patients can come off easily. This is safe and effective for chronic pain. None of, this is, none of that was true. Opioids for chronic pain, for the vast majority of patients, not safe or effective. They can even make pain worse. It's a phenomenon called hyperalgesia. What we know, especially with data from workers' comp, you treat an injured worker's chronic pain with long-term opioids, that worker is far less likely to ever go back to work again compared to any other intervention you could have offered them for their chronic pain. Doctors would have been a lot less gullible if these messages had only come to us from the attractive sales reps who visit us in our offices. Uh, they come in frequently to promote their products. So, Dr. Kolodny, have you lost weight? You're looking terrific, Dr. Kolodny. They come, they flatter you, they tell you how smart you are. They want you to like them because then you'll have a positive association with their, their products. And of course, they're there to tell you that their products are better than any other competing product that you might want to prescribe. But we would have been much less gullible if it was just those attractive sales reps coming in and telling us, don't worry about opioids getting your patients addicted. It wasn't just the sales reps. We were hearing this from every direction. We were hearing it from our professional societies, from pain specialists eminent in the field of pain medicine. We were hearing it from our hospitals, from state medical boards. Everyone was telling doctors from every direction, you were hearing that if you're an enlightened doctor in the know, you're going to be different from those puritanical doctors. You'll understand that opioids are a gift from Mother Nature and should be used much more for just about any complaint of, of pain. And of course, as we responded to that messaging and the prescribing went up, it led to, to the epidemic. So these were the different aspects of the campaign. I won't, won't bore you with that. This is a photograph I took. So just, I'll tell you quickly, the Joint Commission is an agency that regulates hospitals. How many of you have been in a hospital where you were asked about pain or a family member was in the hospital and asked about pain and they, and they had these charts with smiley faces and frowny faces? I see a lot of you nodding. So that's, those rules were required by the Joint Commission which regulates hospitals. And when the Joint Commission came up with those rules, it had a financial relationship with Purdue Pharma, which included Purdue Pharma. This is a photograph I took at a pain conference at the table that Purdue Pharma was uh, exhibiting at, where they were giving out materials uh, on how to make your hospital compliant with these new, new rules. Um, so this was a, a campaign, uh, a multifaceted campaign, that really thought of just about every way possible to get doctors to prescribe more opioids, and it worked. So I mentioned that we doctors were taught not to worry about getting our patients addicted. The statistic that was used was much less than 1% of patients will get addicted when you put them on long-term opioids. That was the statistic. Now I want you to all imagine for a moment that you're a young doctor, you're recently out of your medical school training, and you're reading a textbook 
and you're in a chapter called pain and addiction and you come across a statistic that says much less than 1% of patients will get addicted when they're put on opioids long term. And you read it and it strikes you as strange because you can still remember your medical school pharmacology class and you're thinking, that oxycodone molecule looks a lot like the heroin molecule. How can you put people on a drug just like heroin for months and years and much less than 1% will get addicted? It strikes you as strange. So what do you do? You turn to the back of the chapter in the textbook because you want to see the reference to support the statistic. What you would see when you turn to the back of the chapter is this. Porter and Jick Addiction Rare Patients Treated with Narcotics, New England Journal of Medicine, 1980. It's in the late 90s through the 2000s. Everybody's citing this 1980 reference. Now, you, you see this reference and it looks pretty good. The title looks good. New England Journal of Medicine, that's about as good as it gets. That's one of our best medical journals. Maybe you'd stop there. You'd say, okay, well, I, they've got a support for this statement. But let's say you, know, you're, you really want to know what they did in the study. So what do you do? You go online. You go to a website called PubMed, which gives you the abstract, the summary for, for journal articles. You figure, I just want to see what they did in the abstract and the summary. So you go to PubMed. You type this in. Nothing comes up on PubMed. That seems strange. You type it in again. Maybe you think you spelled something wrong, so you keep typing it in. Nothing comes up. You're wondering, well, maybe it's too old. Maybe PubMed doesn't go back to 1980. That's why I get nothing when I type it in. That wasn't it, though, because PubMed goes back way past 1980. Maybe you'd stop there, but maybe you say, you know, I'm still not buying it. I want to know what they did. So you make your way to the medical library. You pull out the 1980 volume of the New England Journal of Medicine. You open it up. What you would find out is that what everybody was citing as proof that we didn't have to worry about getting our patients addicted, what was even being referred to as a landmark study that proved we didn't have to worry about getting our patients addicted, it wasn't actually a peer-reviewed journal article. It was this. This is the whole thing. This is Porter and Jick, a one-paragraph letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And if you read the letter, it's not talking about long-term use of opioids and risk of addiction. It's a, they're describing a chart review study where they looked at hospitalized patients who had been given morphine or Demerol while in a hospital bed. And they only found out of 11,882 charts, four charts where the nurse or the doctor wrote in the chart that a patient suddenly appeared drug seeking after getting a dose of morphine in a hospital bed. This of course tells you nothing about the risk of addiction when people are put on opioids long term. The federal government a few years ago sponsored a re review looking at all of the available evidence on long-term use of opioids. What they found out is highlighted here in yellow. After looking at all of the available research, they concluded, we've looked at every study. We can't find evidence that putting people on long-term opioids helps them. But we did find evidence that it's dangerous. And the higher the dose, the more dangerous it is. And if you just think about that for a second, if you think about any kind of medical intervention, surgery, for example, a surgical procedure that somebody might need, or, or medicine that's potentially dangerous. Uh, think about any kind of medical intervention. If a doctor doesn't know that it's going to help you, but they know that it's dangerous, you expect that that would be something a doctor would prescribe very rarely. But in the United States, opioids continue to be routinely prescribed for chronic pain. It's not just long-term use that we have to worry about. A lot of the long-term use begins with short-term use. The CDC published a study where they found that if you take an opioid every day for five days, one in five patients, if you take an opioid every day for 10 days, one in five patients is still going to be on an opioid a year later. Take an opioid every day for 30 days straight, 40% of patients are still on an opioid one year later. 
for many types of acute pain, we don't have to use an opioid at all. They did a study, that, this is a study that was published, where patients who came into emergency rooms with fractures, anybody ever have a bone fracture? That's, it's pretty painful. They gave half the patients an opioid, they gave half the patients a combination of Advil plus Tylenol, which you can take together because they work differently. It's not dangerous to take Advil and Tylenol together. And what they found was that the pain control was just as good with less side effects than the people who got the Advil plus the Tylenol. So how do we bring our opioid addiction epidemic to an end? Well, I, the first two things here are really the same ways we'd respond to any kind of disease epidemic. Think about what you would do if there was an Ebola outbreak and you were put in charge of an Ebola outbreak in your community. What would you do? If you stopped and thought about it for a few minutes, you'd say, okay, there are two things we need to do about the Ebola outbreak. We need to contain it to prevent more people from getting the infection and we need to treat the people with the infection so they don't die from it. That's pretty much what we need to do about the opioid addiction epidemic. We have to contain it. We have to prevent more Americans from becoming opioid addicted, reduce the incidence, the number of new cases of opioid addiction that are occurring every year, and we have to see that the people who are opioid addicted receive effective treatment for their opioid addiction so it doesn't kill them. Now the third bullet here makes people think about the war on drugs. Uh, supply control, which in the war on drugs rightly has a bad reputation because it didn't work and it contributed to mass incarceration. Um, but there is a role for closing down pill mills and for making it more difficult to access fentanyl and heroin. Because if you can make it harder for people who are addicted to have easy access to heroin and painkillers and fentanyl, while at the same time making it easier for them to access treatment, more people will seek treatment. If it's this simple, why haven't we done this? If, if control, why has the epidemic gotten worse every year for 25 years, except for maybe in 2018, finally? You know, why, what, what took us so long to bring this problem potentially under control? Well, I think that the answer is that for many years, and it was very frustrating because I've, I've watched this happen, uh, for many years, as the epidemic was getting worse, opioid manufacturers, the drug companies, were very clever in the way they kept framing the problem. Has anybody been paying attention to the lawsuit that the state of Massachusetts filed against Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers? If you've been watching that in the press or reading about it, there was an email that was became public. An email written by Richard Sackler, who ran Purdue Pharma. And what he wrote in this email, and it was written in the early 2000s as OxyContin was getting bad press because it was killing people and getting people addicted. In his email, he wrote, we have to hammer on the abusers. They're the dr junkies. They're the criminals. What was he saying? We have to frame the problem as if it's all, all the bad problems are related to drug abusers and pain patients are totally different in being helped and any kind of reduction in prescribing would punish the pain patients for the bad behavior of the drug abusers. Or in other words, don't punish the pain patients because of the drug abusers. That was the message. And that message worked. This, it was show, this was a slide shown at an FDA meeting. There was an FDA meeting where they were going to put Vicodin into a more restrictive category. And the argument against putting Vicodin in a more restrictive category is you're going to punish this poor woman with pain because of the bad behavior of the drug abuser. But it was never really true that we had these two distinct groups with the harms limited to people just taking opioids for fun and pain patients are all being helped. That was never true. We know that it's not much less than 1% of patients who get addicted, but prevalence of opioid use disorder, opioid addiction in patients who are on opioids, it's common. About 41% of patients on long-term opioids will meet criteria for opioid use disorder. Deaths are common in patients on, on opioids. I'm going to start to finish up here. I want to make a couple of final points. This is the AIDS epidemic. And what you're looking at here is deaths from AIDS. And you could see they peaked around 1995, and then the deaths plummeted. And why did the deaths drop 
like uh, drop so significantly in 1996, 97, what, what happened? We had the introduction of medicines that allowed us to treat HIV infection so it didn't kill people. And the reason I'm showing you this slide is to make a point because I, I believe that we have a medication available to us right now that if there was better access to it, we could see deaths drop in the same way we saw deaths drop from, from HIV infection. And the medicine that I'm talking about is called buprenorphine. The brand name for it is, is Suboxone. It is an opioid medicine that's used for treating opioid addiction. And it may sound strange to you that I've just spent this whole time telling you how the way in which doctors prescribe an opioid caused the public health crisis. And now I'm saying we need more prescribing of opioids to respond to the crisis. But that is what I'm saying. And I'm not just speculating when I say that I think better access to buprenorphine would allow us to decrease deaths. It happened in France. France didn't have an addic a new addiction epidemic like we had, but they did have a large group of heroin users who were dying at a high rate. And you see their deaths here in black. And when buprenorphine prescribing went up, deaths from heroin started to come down. And so I do think with better access to buprenorphine in the United States, we could start to see deaths come down. Uh, access is beginning to improve. Prescribing is uh, getting a bit more cautious. And this is what I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. This is showing us for the first time what could be you know, a decrease, potentially bending the curve. Finally, we may start to see overdose deaths come down. So I will stop here. Uh, in summary, the US is in the midst of the worst drug addiction epidemic in its history. To bring the epidemic under control, we have to prevent more Americans from getting opioid addicted, mainly through much more cautious prescribing. And we have to see that the people who are addicted can access effective treatment. Thank you. Take some questions, comments? <laughs> yes. I think it was this last summer that there was a case that was set up in Oklahoma and Melvin Johnson. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I do know what you're talking about because I, I actually testified. Uh, on behalf of the state of Oklahoma in that case. It was a lawsuit. The state yeah. sued Purdue Pharma, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and Johnson & Johnson. Purdue and Teva paid. They settled. Johnson & Johnson refused. And the case went all the way. Uh, uh, the tri there was a trial that went all the way against Johnson & Johnson. And the judge ruled against Johnson & Johnson for $572 million. For a company like Johnson & Johnson that's worth over $300 billion, do you think that this is in any way actually going to be affected with the current opioid epidemic? Or is it just like a quick um, So the, the money that, uh, right now that, that's just one state, and states across the country are suing multiple opioid manufacturers and distributors, not just states but counties. There are hundreds of lawsuits that have been, been filed, and some of them are beginning to settle. The only one that was actually tried all the way was, was the Johnson & Johnson case. The money, and I think there will be considerable sums in the billions when, they, when it starts to come in nationally, um, will help. Um, but will certainly not solve uh, the, the opioid crisis. But there is an advantage. There's, there's a benefit, a public health benefit from this litigation, um, which may not be totally clear. Um, if you think about the litigation against big tobacco, which was probably before some of you were, were born, um, the, in the United States, when the big tobacco companies were sued, that litigation resulted in the American public learning about how tobacco companies targeted teenagers. And the public learned about how tobacco companies manipulated nicotine levels. And they learned about how tobacco companies lied. They lied about risk of addiction. They lied about cancer. And when all of that bad behavior became known to the American public, that changed attitudes about smoking in the United States in a way that may have been m more significant than the money that was used uh, on social marketing campaigns. I'm hopeful that through the litigation, through learning about this bad behavior, the more the public becomes familiar, that maybe we'll get to a point where Americans 
become, will think twice before popping an opioid for just about any pain problem, which is uh, something that needs to happen. And there are other lessons we can learn from through the litigation about fixes that need to be made. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how kind of doctors and the professional societies kind of make um, decisions about prescriptions and what to recommend prescribing. And are those groups skeptical of, let's say, research from a pharmaceutical company that might be biased? Uh, not skeptical enough. So one of the things that, so professional societies, the way that works is, um, once you uh, graduate medical school and you choose your medical specialty, whatever medical specialty you choose, there's usually an association. So if you become an emergency medicine doctor, there's the American College of Emergency Physicians and you'll, often you'll join that group. If you become a psychiatrist, you join the American Psychiatric Association. If you're a surgeon, the surgeon, so, and you have all of these different professional societies that, that um, the doctors become a member of. And those professional societies often often will put out consensus guidelines, practice guidelines, recommendations, where they bring a bunch of experts to give recommendations to how a particular condition should be treated. And one of the things that's happened frequently in the US, and not just with opioids, is that the doctors who get pulled together to make the recommendations to other doctors have, in some cases, been doctors who have financial relationships with the companies that make these products. And so, just to give you an example, the American Geriatric Society, the group representing doctors who treat seniors, put out a recommendation about eight or nine years ago saying that if a senior has pain, opioids are preferred to giving NSAIDs, drugs like Advil. Now, all drugs have risks, um, but uh, opioids are, gen and for some, some patients do need one or the other based on their medical problems, but to put out this recommendation that in general opioids are preferred to NSAIDs, that shouldn't have happened and it was the wrong recommendation, yet the doctors who were on that committee most of them, I believe, had relationships to the drug companies that made opioids. And we see that happen over and over again. When we talk about you know, the litigation, what we can learn from it, and, and lessons from our opioid crisis, one of the lessons is that we need better firewalls to prevent pharmaceutical companies from influencing medical practice. And unfortunately, I don't really see that much, of, that much happening yet, um, which is a shame because if you know, a public health catastrophe, a half a million people, 500,000 deaths over the past 20 years from, from opioids. If that's not enough to come up with new, new firewalls and new ways of, of regulating drug companies, I don't know what is. Thank you. Thank you very much.